Hello, uh, welcome to the Human and Non-Human Permanent Cell Atlas Publication Package webinar. Please feel free to drop a question into the Q&A at any time. Um, we'll get to the Q&A at the end of, this, of the webinar and we may not get to every question. Uh, without further ado, I'll pass things on to Ed Lean who will introduce the webinar. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ed Lean. I'm a senior investigator at the Allen Institute for Brain Science and also a PI as part of the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. I'm really pleased to be able to give an introduction and a little bit of context um, to the body of work that you're going to hear about today. Uh, this is work that was supported by the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, or BICCN, to really begin mapping the cellular and molecular organization of the human and non-human primate brain. Um, this body of work is really, uh, I think, represents a pretty remarkable advance for the field and was highlighted in a series of 21 papers in total in issues of science, science advances, and also uh, science translational medicine that were all coordinated as a package. Um, as I mentioned, this work is supported by the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. Uh, this is a major NIH initiative that um, the various groups we'll be talking about are part of. Um, the goal of BICCN was really twofold. It was first to apply single cell methods to be able to begin creating comprehensive cell atlases of the mouse brain, while at the same time establishing scalable methods that could be used to start to map out much larger, more complex brains in non-human primate and ultimately human, of course. Um, this work has been really so successful that it's, it's enabled the next phase called the Brain Initiative Cell Atlas Network, or BICAN, that's already underway. Uh, it was really the work that was part of this package that enabled us to think about the scale up to be able to do comprehensive cell atlasing of the human and non-human primate brain. Um, the package here today really comprises a set of themes. Um, a lot of this was focused on the use of single cell genomics as a really scalable approach that can be applied to human or non-human primate brain tissues in adult or development. Um, and so the, the papers fall into a set of categories um, of mapping the cellular diversity to create atlases, uh, ultimately, of the adult human brain, the adult non-human primate brain as a model organism, uh, the developing uh, human and non-human primate brain, comparative studies across species, and then also using other techniques to look at um, anatomical and physiological properties of cells and model um, human-specific properties in particular cases. Um, I really want to mention that the data behind all of these projects is, is available to the public. Uh, this is a core tenet of the BICCN uh, to make these data freely available. Uh, the data resources and visualization platforms for these papers are all centralized on the BICCN website. Uh, so I encourage you to, uh, to uh, leverage these for your own research. And then finally, um, the Atlas is created or brain by BICCN <clears throat> and now BICAN um, are also contributing to body-wide atlases as well. So there are several other major efforts. Uh, one is the NIH-supported uh, HubMap program. Another is the Human Cell Atlas program that are trying to integrate efforts across the different organ systems uh, to really create body-wide atlases. And these are really going to be catalytic, fundamental, foundational references for understanding uh, both brain and body function and dysfunction in disease. Uh, so this is really exciting time, I think, for the field uh, to see all of this progress and uh, really thrilled that you'll get to hear from some of the authors on some of the, uh, the component studies of the package here. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to the speakers. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. I'd like to uh, invite Kimberly Saletti to join us. Um, Kimberly Saletti is an assistant professor in the University Medical Center Utrecht in the Netherlands. She completed her PhD in 2017 at the Rockefeller University with Jim Hudspeth studying cell development in the inner ear. She followed this work with a postdoc in Stan Lenarsen's lab at the Karolinska Institute using single cell genomics to characterize cellular diversity across both developing mouse and adult human brains. She recently started her own group, which will focus on the molecular mechanisms that generate cellular diversity in the brain. Take it away, Kimberly. Hello, 
Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. <laughs> and uh, hopefully the screen is uh, shared correctly. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for the invitation to be here today. I'm excited to summarize our contribution to this exciting package. Uh, what I'm talking about today uh, is my postdoctoral work, um, which I did with Sten Lennerson at the Karolinska Institute. And this was a wonderful collaboration with the Allen Institute for Brain Science. Um, and I will just uh, dive right in if I can share my, hmm, okay. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so this particular paper was especially inspired by some of the single cell RNA sequencing atlases that have come out in the mouse over the last several years. These have, it probably goes without saying, now revolutionized our understanding of cellular diversity across the brain. And eventually we'd like to understand how this uh, compares to the human brain. And so we set out to begin answering this question. Um, our strategy was to dissect approximately 100 areas across the entire human brain. Uh, Rebecca Hodge led this effort. So uh, she performed dissections from 100 areas in three different donors and isolated nuclei from these regions. The schematics are shown, um, the schematic is shown in this slide here. You can see that uh, given the size of the cortex, many of the dissections come from the cortex, but we set out to sample from the other major brain regions as well, including the hypothalamus, the thalamus, um, the brain stem, and the cerebellum. We ended up with about two and a half million neurons and about 900,000 non-neuronal cells. And we took an iterative approach to clustering the data. Uh, first, we pooled all the cells together and identified major groups in the data. Um, these are called superclusters in our analysis, and these are shown on the T-SNE on the right-hand side here. You can see that these superclusters correspond roughly to major islands on the T-SNE, and that many of them are cell types that you'll recognize, like um, deep layer excitatory neurons, upper layer excitatory neurons, different types of interneurons. We took each supercluster and then analyzed it separately to produce clusters. And then we took each cluster and analyzed it separately to produce subclusters. Uh, and we ended up with about 3,000 subclusters in total. I won't focus uh, on the clusters and subclusters today. Of course, there's lots of new information in this data set, but I just wanna give you a sort of broad sense of the structure of the human brain. And so for that, I'll focus on the superclusters. One thing we noticed right away was that superclusters largely reflect their developmental history. So in this plot here, um, all the dissections are arranged along the x-axis and all the superclusters are arranged along the y-axis. And each dot represents the fraction of cells from a dissection that contribute to a supercluster. And so if you look along a row, um, you can see what dissections have contributed to a particular supercluster. And you might notice, for example, that many of the superclusters are found across the entire telencephalon. So all these blue uh, dots here. And this is the developmental compartment that gives rise to the cortex, hippocampus, and cerebral nuclei. Uh, maybe even more strikingly, um, you can see this principle in some uh, migrated cells. So here we have a supercluster that contains cells primarily from the midbrain and the thalamus. And indeed, there are neurons that migrate from the midbrain into the thalamus during developments. And you can apparently even see this in the adult transcriptomic signature. We can also see this in some glia. So we don't see nearly as much diversity in the glia as we do in the neurons, um, but we can still see this developmental principle. Um, here you can see that there are two major groups of astrocytes and oligodendrocyte precursors, each of which is found within and outside of the telencephalon. The other broad observation I wanna mention today um, is a supercluster that looked a bit strange to us. Uh, we ended up calling the supercluster the splatter neurons, um, and that's because it looked a bit like someone had splashed paint on our T's knee. Uh, and honestly, it was actually very hard to come up with a better, more concise biological uh, kind of term for these. Um, these the supercluster contained neurons from all over, um, particularly the hypothalamus, midbrain, and hindbrain. They were also extremely diverse. Um, in this supercluster, we found over 1,100 subclusters, which was 900 more subclusters than any other supercluster in the data set. And these uh, neurons uh, included multiple types of neurotransmitters. So we saw both excitatory and inhibitory neurons here. Um, we also saw serotonergic neurons and dopaminergic neurons. And in trying to make sense 
of these cells. Um, we have also tried different approaches for looking at them. Alejandro Mossi in Sten's group uh, looked at these regions, uh, particularly the midbrain and the hindbrain with spatial transcriptomics. And he made the interesting observation that some of the neuropeptides he was interested in, he could only find in a handful of cells. And so when you think about a cell like that, that's so rare um, in the region it's found, uh, you might imagine that they would end up someplace sort of in the center of this embedding here. In other words, these neurons would be very difficult to cluster if they weren't sampled deeply enough. And so indeed we think that these splatter neurons are undersampled. And we tested this a bit uh, computationally. Um, we down that, downsampled the whole data set and that's shown here um, on the left-hand side in this uh, TC. And then we would remove um, all, all the cells from a supercluster except five. And then we would recluster the entire data set. And then we would check where these five neurons ended up. And in most cases, when we took out a non-telencephalic supercluster, the remaining cells, um, as you can see in this example here, ended up clustering with the splatter neurons. And so this leads us to conclude that most neuronal diversity is likely outside the telencephalon. And if we sampled these neurons more deeply, we would start to see them form their own islands on the TCN and likely form new superclusters. And so in conclusion, uh, one of the major findings of our paper here is that regional diversity is found in all neuroepithelial cell types across the brain. Um, and this is especially true outside the telencephalon where we have a lot more to learn. Um, and this will require probably much deeper sampling, which I know the Allen Institute is already uh, taking uh, on. I just want to uh, briefly mention, as uh, Ed already pointed out, that our data is available um, not only to download, but also to browse. You can find links at the GitHub associated with the paper. And our data has been uh, uh, included on the Cell X Gene browser from uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, and this browser has been uh, really uh, easy and helpful to work with. So I definitely recommend using it. And so I'll just wrap up by acknowledging everyone who is involved uh, in this work and, and thanking you for your time. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for that um, for that great presentation. Um, next up, we'll have Trigva Bakken. Trigva, if you could turn on your video, please. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Trigva Bakken is an assistant investigator at the Allen Institute for Brain Science, where he co-leads efforts to characterize and target cell types in the mammalian brain using single cell multiomic sequencing. He applies computational approaches to study how evolution has shaped cellular diversity in the human brain and to uncover gene regulatory changes driving species innovations and variation across individuals. Trigva completed an MD and a PhD in neuroscience at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, Trigva, take it away. Thanks, Yasmin. I'm happy to join this webinar. And I uh, just want to say this work that I'm representing was really a, a lot of effort from co colleagues at the Allen Institute and also with uh, collaborators outside. So really a lot of effort from everyone. Um, there's been longstanding interest in what makes us unique, what makes our brains unique. Um, and, you know, as a large brained primate, we have many cortical neurons uh, in this region of the brain that's responsible for higher cognition. Um, and but in fact, whales have even more. Um, and likewise, we, for many years, neuroanatomists have observed uh, specialized morphologies of neurons, very interesting shaped neurons in the human brain that were not observed in rodents, for example. But with a uh, more careful study and looking more broadly at, at our closest relatives, uh, you in fact see some of these so-called von Economo neurons in uh, other great apes. And so, uh, you know, the, the answer, of course, in, in many things in biology, it's likely both of these things that um, let, let lead to our uh, own special species abilities. Um, but we could really bring a molecular lens to this question um, and use single nucleus RNA sequencing to profile a region of the brain, the middle temporal gyrus in the temporal lobe of the, the, the cortex, um, and profile the transcriptome of those cells from humans, uh, two non-human great apes, uh, chimpanzee and gorilla, and uh, two monkeys, macaque and marmoset. 
And uh, you know, with a fairly balanced sampling of males and females and a handful of individuals from each species and quite deep sampling of uh, 75 to 100,000 nuclei per, per species to really allow us to detect uh, even very rare cell types. So using these data, um, we could represent the diversity of cells based on their transcriptomic similarity shown here in these U maps. Um, this is showing a subset of the inhibitory neurons. And you can see in the first row that uh, each species looks, uh, you know, the shape of the U maps looks a little different, um, but uh, I think the colors kind of will lead you to um, guide your eye to see that there's really a lot of similarity here too. And in fact, there's enough conserved expression, we can align these cells across the species and, and find that there really is a consensus set of types that's shared across all five of these species. These don't always match one-to-one, -one, uh, but we, we do see some um, subspecialization, but, uh, but in all, there's really a conserved parts list in this part of the cortex across these primates. We could we had some additional information uh, from the great apes. Uh, my colleague Rebecca Hodge did these dissections and really had finally dissected different layers of the cortex from human, chimp, and gorilla. And that enabled us uh, at, at sort of a coarse resolution to get uh, a sense of the laminar distributions of these types. And uh, what I think you can appreciate is that they're really quite similar um, across the great apes. And likewise, we could, uh, because this is single nucleus uh, sequencing, uh, we had some additional validation and C2 data to, to um, that we've done also in the past that has shown that single nucleus um, profiling is relatively unbiased and it allowed us to estimate abundances of different cell types. And what we saw is again, uh, similar to the laminar distributions being conserved, we saw quite similar abundances um, across these of these species with larger differences in marmoset. But among the great apes, things look very similar. But we could also look at gene expression. We have these same cell types, uh, but perhaps the genes vary. And in fact, that's what we see. So there, there are uh, gene differences um, uh, that we found across each pair of species. And as one might expect, uh, as we get farther uh, evolutionary distance from our most recent common ancestor with each of these species, uh, the differences increase. Uh, but one surprise came out is that uh, the glial cells, not the neurons, are actually diverging more rapidly. And so that's shown in this middle plot where I'm plotting uh, the, the similarity of human, uh, human expression for each of these different types uh, versus the other four uh, primate species. You can see the pink line uh, microglia are really diverging quite rapidly. And another uh, interesting point that came out of this is uh, this divergence with evolu evolutionary distance did not completely hold. And one surprise was that the chimpanzee uh, had more similar expression to a gorilla than to humans. And this really suggested, even though uh, chimpanzees are more closely related to us, this really suggests that there's uh, a faster change in the neurons uh, on the human lineage. And, and we, we could dive into, well, what might be driving uh, some of these expression changes that we see in humans? And what one uh, potential is the, these very specific mutations in our genome compared to other great apes, but also compared to mammals in general. So these have been described for quite a few years now. Um, they're, they're known as human accelerated regions. So it's shown in this schematic here where you have single bases that are only different in humans, shared across many human individuals, but different than, than our uh, chimpanzees. And what we find, a previous work has shown that these changes are often linked to uh, gene regulatory regions. And in fact, we find that these HARs are uh, significantly enriched near the differentially expressed genes um, that we found uh, in comparing to chimpanzee. And up to 40% of the differentially expressed genes are near these accelerated uh, changes in the genome. And so this, this was a suggestion that perhaps these changes are not just due to um, a neutral drift or not really having, uh, it suggests that they perhaps have some functional impact in that, that there's a selection acting on the genome to change these uh, genes. And the question is, where are these genes? Um, and what we find is that there's really significant enrichment 
of genes that are uh, encoding proteins that localize to the synapse. And so these are the genes that are really contributing to neuronal wiring and changes of those wiring or plasticity um, with experience, for example. And so just one example of this is this gene PTPRG, which is a lower, than, lower in humans compared to the other uh, primates. Um, and there's a, a HAR that sits quite close to the transcription start site for this gene. Um, and there's a single mutation sitting in a transcription factor binding site within this human accelerated region. And previous work has shown that this uh, mutation actually changes the uh, enhancer activity of this uh, HAR um, enhancer region um, in, in a separate, in a separate uh, neuronal culture. So I think that this leveraging genomic changes to uh, better understand uh, what uh, has actually specialized in humans and what has functional relevance is, is, is really key. So just very quickly, uh, I think I've shown you the parts list is shared. The neuronal wiring is a really a hot spot for these expression changes. And again, we can leverage the genomic changes to, to understand adaptive change. And finally, uh, echoing what Ed told you is that all these data are available uh, to online, uh, both raw data and a couple of these viewers. And thanks to everyone uh, who participated in this, uh, this work. And thanks for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Trigva, for that great presentation. I'd like to introduce Lee Juen Liu. Dr. Lee Juen Liu is uh, currently an associate professor with the Southeast University in China. She's interested in whole brain connectome and the single cell level and the, and the characterization of neural types based on neural, sorry, neuronal morphology and other characteristics. She's leading a neuronal morphology group in this SEU Allen Joint Center at the Institute of Brain and Intelligence at Southeast University in China. Um, please take it away. Okay, thanks, Esme, for the introduction. So I'm really glad to have this opportunity to introduce our work. Uh, we are trying to dissect the brain, human brain, the single cortical neurons, how it looks like. I mean, the morphological diversity and stereotypy. So this is the structures we are trying to use. So to study the single neural level in the whole brain wide, we build tech platforms, either the computer node and the experimental platforms for targeting and visualizing single neurons for both mouse and human in large scales. So first, I would like to I would like to introduce the computer node platforms. So we developed this collaborative augmented platforms. So it means the main idea is the collaboration. So people can use either desktop and also the virtual reality VR and even your mobile phone. And also we developed uh, brain killer games. People can work together to do the tracing for the neural structures and also use a virtual reality can make sure we get the precise structures. It means so we can work anywhere. It means even you can use the, uh, the just the, general times can work on taking the images to get these structures done. So this is the whole idea for this platform. So for the experimental part, actually, so when the patient with the tumor, this is the site. So for the doctors, when they design the surgery, um, it's, it's not avoidable. We can get some normal tissues. So make sure we can get the tissue, make, make sure we can get the tumor out. So this normal brain surgical tissue, so we can use this for brain experiments. So we, may, we cut it into the brain slices and then use the DSA microscopy guided dye injections. And this is a micro needle to inject the dye into the soma area. And then all this dye go into the dendrite. So we can see clearly this neuron shows up. We can see the dendritic structures and also even the spines. So using our platforms, we can get a 3D traced morphologies and also we can map them back to the whole brain level. Clearly see, so this colored, it means where this neuron from. So we can get different brain regions neural structures. Okay, sorry. So using this method, we have collected once, uh, sorry. We have collected 1,746 
inject images. So these are some samples from different brain regions we collected. So we can clearly see this the these structures from the either FG, MFG, and SFG, and also other brain regions. They show the distinct structures. So we can see the dendritic lens and also the stem branches are quite different. So this is the doctor's mapping, mapping all these neural structures back to the whole brain levels. So we click this eight exclusive cortical regions and also some two brain regions is not, it's just, uh, it's collected together. So this is a doctor's mapping. Also to double this, uh, we used computational way to make sure the brain region slices and make sure the precise brain regions. So we mapped all these brain extraction tissues back to the whole brain area. This green area is the disease area and also the red color, it means the brain tissue extraction regions. So we can clearly say, for example, this brain, uh, this is the tissue extraction regions and this is the tumor area. This is a map. So all brain tissues extraction regions, each color stands for each brain region. Since we get all these structures, so we are trying to dissect, I mean, the characteristics characteristics for each brain regions. And also since these patients are from different ages and also from different gender, we are also curious. So is there any difference between the age, for example, the younger one, 20 years old, and also the older person, 70 years old. And also people first will ask, so how do it look like in males? I mean, the brain and also female, are they different? Interesting thing is the neurons are more diverse cross brain regions, that age and gender. So we did the feature computational analysis using six key features, for example, sterms, branch, lens, and also bifurcate and local, and another just angle remote, cast off dimension, these six key features to do the feature analysis. This, after the UMAP, we can clearly see, so the age and the gender is not that diverse. I mean, couldn't see clear different difference in this data set. But the brain regions, we can see the trend in the five largest numbers of cortical brain regions. We can clearly see different brain regions. They can show the diverse neural structures. And also I will give you an example. These are two near brain regions, IPL and PL. We can, for, for example, these neurons, I mean, neural examples, we can clearly see the structure for example, the branches, I mean, and also the lens, the, especially the stern branches from two brain regions, they are quite different. And also after the computational feature analysis, we can clearly see they are separated. These are the IPL brain region structures, and these are the PL structures. So they are quite different. So as I said, use the, the feature analysis, although we can see the trend, I mean, it's different in different brain regions, but uh, clearly they are not separate uh, quite obviously. It, I mean, it's not good to see what's the difference in each brain regions. So we developed this tensor field analysis. We designed spatial tensors. I mean, we use these spatial tensors to analysis the feature textures and also use the spatial adjacency features. We can see, after the spatial tensor analysis, we found clear modules of organization of brain anatomy, which indicate that dendritic features of neurons are strongly conserved within each cohort, but also the interlace between regions. For example, we can clearly say, after the tensor field analysis, this clearly we have a cohort. I mean, the different brain regions, they can show conserved regions. And also, especially compared to the spatial adjacency before we use the spatial tensors analysis, it's quite similar. We couldn't see, I mean, what's a pattern for the brain regions. But after we use our spatial tensor field analysis, we can see for the brain regions, there is a clearly the cohort. I mean, see the patterns in the brain regions and also use the 
augmented aeration tensor field, you can clearly see the pattern in the brain regions. So this is a method very, really useful because for the brain regions, it's really hard to trace axonal fibers. So even for the adult brain, I mean, even we use the antibody staining and also the dye, it's, since it's really huge, I mean, it's really hard to exactly to know where the axon goes. But to use this method, we can get the predict information for the brain regions. I mean, we collect, as long as we collect more dendritic structures, we will get more information for this anatomy I mean, human brain region structures. This is the new method we designed. So this is our method. And thanks for the collaborations. I mean, our collaborators from Beijing Tianan Hospital and also Allo Institute people, uh, Adeline and uh, Michael, and also we, our collaborator from GMU, Georgia. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. That's my presentation. Hi. Thank you so much for that um, great presentation. Thank you. I want, I want to introduce uh, Wei Qian. Um, Wei Qian is a bioinformatics scientist at the Ecker Lab at the Salk Institute. He finished his PhD with Zhe Liang at University of Illinois in Chicago, developing computational methods to study protein structures and biophysical properties. He then joined the Ecker Lab to study cell diversity and gene regulation in human and mouse brains using single cell epigenomics. Please take it away. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, share our works. And you have heard the studies on the transcriptomics and the morphology of brain cells. I would like to share um, uh, share a bit about the gene regulation underlying. Our works uh, focus on the epigenomics of uh, human brain, especially in the uh, DNA methylation and also the uh, chromosome 3 d structures. We adopted two assays developed in our lab. It's called the SNMC seq, which profile the uh, DNA methylation from single nucleus, and also the SNMC seq, which uh, pro is a co assay profiling uh, both um, DNA methylation and uh, chromatin uh, confirmation. So we use this. Uh, we apply this two assay um, over. Uh, 500,000 cells uh, from uh, six uh, of uh, 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 46 brain region from three donors, and uh, um, uh, the M3C cell uh, comp the compose uh, the largest uh, single cell high C data set so far, which allow us uh, to study the uh, chromosome 3 d structures uh, like the uh, compartment, domain, and loop of uh, 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 brain cells, and more generally to study the relation between this. Uh, 3D structure feature and other uh, molecular uh, uh, features. Uh, due to the time limit, I can now share all the results, but I want to share one of the example. Basically, we observe the specific contact distance distribution in these uh, single cells. And you can see uh, like the, the cortical inhibitor neuron has a, 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 has a, this a short uh, interaction, uh, chromatin interaction in re uh, 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 enriched, but uh, for the uh, like uh, microglia, this kind of uh, non-neuronal cell, their context is more uh, has more context in this uh, longer distance. And this uh, this uh, spectrum uh, actually was previously thought to be related to the uh, cell cycle, but we uh, our results show that this actually is, can be cell type specific. And uh, the um, uh, ratio between this uh, uh, short distance, uh, short distance uh, and long longer distance is highly correlated to the global gene expression level of the cell types. And uh, uh, our uh, epigenomics uh, features uh, can uh, tell us more about the gene regulation in the uh, uh, brain cell, for example, this uh, DNA methylation on the um, uh, gene body can uh, is uh, highly correlated with uh, gene expression, and also the uh, genome-wide uh, uh, determination of the, this uh, differentially methylated region can uh, predict the cis regulatory element, especially in enhancer. And also, our high C data can tell us the interaction between these two. A uh, joint analysis of all these uh, molecular features. Um, can uh, actually help us to determine the uh, 3.2 millions of, uh, uh, oh, sorry, 
three point uh, half has determined three point two millions of uh, pairs between this uh, cis regulatory element and also the genes. And here is an example. Um, you can see uh, the uh, molecular features from one of the major um, uh, cortical uh, cell type and the other is a subcortical uh, cell type. You can see the in this uh, uh, cortical cell types, uh, there's a more uh, common interaction here between the uh, cis regulatory element and also the uh, gene. And also you can see actually in this uh, cell type, it's a more hypomethylated in the uh, gene body and also the, the, the potentially enhancer uh, region. And uh, uh, this um, this uh, uh, cell type cell type specific um, uh, cis regular element also can uh, help provide more insights to our understanding of the uh, brain disorders by compare uh, our uh, results with the previous uh, GVAS result. Uh, we can uh, identify the implication of uh, brain cell types uh, in uh, brain disorders. So for example, this uh, uh, microglia, we found that microglia is more implicated in the uh, Alzheimer disease and also like the, the uh, uh, cell, cell types from uh, basal ganglia is more related to this uh, uh, tobacco use disorders. And if we divide, uh, if we, we dive into the detail, we can find more diverse impact of the uh, uh, this uh, uh, disease risk uh, variant on the brain cell types. So for example, both uh, the layer two IT cell and also the uh, layer uh, six CT cells are implicated in the uh, uh, schizophrenia. But you can see for this variant on the left side, it has a, um, a similar impact for both the uh, cell type. But it seems like on the, uh, the other uh, risk variant on the right side is only uh, affects uh, the, the layer uh, two, three IT cells. And another thing to be uh, find very interesting is that we know uh, we know that uh, different brain regions are specialized for different functions. Our data set actually it provide a valuable resource to study the molecular uh, basis of such uh, regional heterogeneity. And by uh, regional uh, heterogeneity here, I I don't mean different region has a different cell type. We actually see that even we see in the same cell type. Uh, the cell type come from different region has a, a, a regional difference, and this is uh, this is a uh, previously uh, known for the uh, cortical excitatory neuron, but uh, not uh, not obvious for the other neuron, especially for the inhibition neuron. To uncover uh, this uh, regional difference, uh, we actually develop a, a framework to. Uh, to study our DNA methylation profile and uh, uh, find a regional axis in the brain cortex from uh, posterior to lateral anterior and then to the medial anterior. And along this axis, you actually can observe the uh, molecular, uh, the, 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 the gradient in molecular features like DNA methylation and uh, uh, gene suppression. And here is an example to show this uh, monotonic change in one of cell type along this axis, but a more complex uh, uh, change can be there. And here is an, uh, a, a very striking example here, basically it's uh, this uh, NR2F1 uh, transcription factor, which is uh, uh, important for the um, brain cortex development. And you can see from different uh, region, it's actually utilized a different uh, uh, regulatory uh, uh, program to regulate the expression of uh, this gene. We also, in the subcortical region, like basal ganglia, we also find the access from the um, uh, ventral to dorsal to lateral, and also see the molecular diff change. And uh, we also compare our uh, uh, DNA methylation profile from the human and to mouse. And you can see in both uh, the cortex region and subcortical regions. And you can see, although it's uh, overall, um, the cell type are conserved, but uh, the human shows more diversity in cell type. And also use the conserved uh, um, uh, uh, Candidate, uh, candidate uh, cis regular elements, we found that uh, the methylation level is uh, quite uh, uh, is, uh, significant conserved. And this comparison actually help us uh, to determine the enhancer uh, by this uh, comparative uh, epigenetics. Uh, last but not least, uh, we observed that uh, the um, we found a, a, a certain CPG site has a very specific um, DNA methylation status to their cell type identi uh, identities. Uh, which seem like the cell had their own intrinsic barcoding. 
So we developed this uh, um, uh, single cell DNA methylation barcode or called uh, SCM codes, uh, which can accurately and uh, robustly predict cell type based on a limit number of uh, CPG sites. And uh, in analogy to the uh, uh, epigenetic clock, this is kind of like uh, epigenetic uh, uh, cell type identity in the uh, single cell. Level. And uh, I think uh, that's all I want to share. And uh, if you are interested in more detail, I, uh, I recommend you to look into our paper. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Wei. I uh, appreciate that great talk. The links to all the papers are in the chat for everyone who's uh, joining us online. I want to introduce Chang Kim. Uh, Chang is a graduate student in bioinformatics in the Nowakowski lab at UCSF. Um, Chang Kim works on technology development surrounding single cell and spatial genomics techniques focused on applications in neurogenomics. Please take it away. All right, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, yeah, I'll be presenting uh, some of our recent work on kind of the spatial atlasing of the developing human thalamus in the first and second trimester. Um, before I kind of get started into kind of diving into the thalamus, I think building on some of our uh, knowledge that has been uh, grounded in kind of cortical aerialization is kind of key here. So I think this paper from the Allen Institute from a few years ago uh, is kind of uh, quite apparent and striking when you see that uh, in this box red population, these are essentially cell type distribution plots, uh, depending on the aerial dissection they did essentially between the motor and visual cortex. And as you can kind of see, the excitatory neuron identity um, essentially defines the cortical area in mice, at least. And as, as you can kind of see in the left uh, from the red uh, box, these are some GABAergic neurons, which are essentially shared between the two uh, areas. And the main reason I'm kind of highlighting this is that uh, some of the findings that we see in the thalamus are kind of in contrast to uh, this, this um, organization that we see in the cortex. Um, and at least in the cortex, if you go into human development, you can already see some of the early specifications of these areas. Uh, uh, from our colleagues here at ECSF, uh, primarily in the Crickstein lab, they have already kind of shown an early atlasing efforts uh, that uh, specific areas like the prefrontal cortex and visual cortex diverge quite early in their uh, neuronal identity. And I think in their most recent work, they've already shown that you, even it precedes uh, neural, uh, neurogenesis at the uh, earlier stages of uh, cell types such as the IPCs. Uh, so the big question for us was that are these principles conserved in uh, different regions, specifically in thalamic development? So uh, the thalamus, as, as some people may know, but essentially is a relay hub for us uh, in kind of relaying uh, visual and sensory inputs. Uh, and more importantly, has uh, important projections into pretty much every major cortical area. Uh, this is kind of not a schematic of the uh, developing thalamus, but the adult thalamus. But um, I think this is probably the easier thing to kind of show. But in our profiling, we essentially have done uh, recent single cell atlases of the thalamus, uh, incorporated them into our spatial transcriptomics data sets that we ran with uh, MRFISH as our technology. Uh, and essentially have been able to profile these specific uh, nuclei. Essentially, I'm not gonna go into every single one, but uh, the LGN, which is the lateral geniculate, for example, is uh, very well characterized and important for uh, projections into the visual cortex and all the way to the anterior uh, nuclei. So once we started spatially registering uh, some of these uh, cell types in the second trimester in particular, uh, well, we did some in the first trimester. I won't go into too much of that uh, because most of our interest was in the second trimester as that is when usually the uh, neurons are maturing and specifically forming nuclei. Uh, so in terms of the spatial registration of our excitatory neurons, uh, we already uh, can already uh, see two distinct populations. I should clarify, in contrast to the cortex, uh, majority, there's a considerably less diversity of excitatory neurons, essentially, in the thalamus. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much of the genes uh, specifically, but uh, what we have done is essentially done uh, six sagittal sections across the second trimester from the lateral to the medial axis. And this, as I was saying before, kind of covered as many of the uh, nuclei as possible. And what we kind of find is 
depending on certain nuclei, there's a combination of EN1 or EN2 uh, uh, expression. And as you go towards the more medial axis, uh, some of the nuclei here are much more uh, specific to the excitatory neurons that are there, as you can kind of see in the last two medial uh, sections from the GWA23 or gestational week 23 sample, that a lot of these nuclei are very distinct with their uh, localization. This is in, in, in line with obviously previous uh, studies in the mice. And um, as you can kind of see in the extrathalamic regions, so non-thalamic, uh, the midbrain and the subthalamic nuclei have very distinct neuron expression. Um, and to kind of go deeper into uh, what defines some of these uh, nuclei excitatory identity, uh, we kind of plotted that uh, some of these specific marker genes we're using, primarily SOX2, uh, which mark one of the excitatory neurons, and FOXP2, which marks the other excitatory neuron. So you can imagine that uh, SOX2 and FOXP2 are an opposing uh, identities for these excitatory neurons. But essentially what we observed is that uh, uh, in these nuclei, they essentially have gradient signatures. So instead of like a binary on and off uh, gene expression profile, they were either high or low in these two kind of axes. And obviously there were a bit more marker genes, but uh, these were the kind of more representative ones. And then we have like neurotensin, which are kind of more specific for specific uh, nuclei, depending on the, uh, 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 the medial axis, um, and also kind of uh, defining the subthalamic nuclei expression. Uh, going into the kind of uh, the diversity of the inhibitory neurons that we kind of observe, uh, based on our single cell atlas, um, we identified approximately six uh, inhibitory neuron subtypes, and I kind of boxed them in three different colors based on the different origins that they come from. So the box in red here at the top, uh, IN2, 5, and 6, are forebrain derived, um, and this is based off of uh, FOXG1 positive expression. And uh, the purple ones are essentially locally derived, and they're marked by LHX1 uh, uh, expression. And then IN1, which is actually the most, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, the most populous uh, inhibitory neuron, it's IN1, which is uh, uh, SOX14, which is uh, midbrain derived. And I think Kimberly kind of uh, briefly went into that in the adult. And at least already in the second trimester, you're already seeing these migration uh, of these uh, uh, inhibitory neurons uh, occurring, and, uh, and in, uh, in particular, some of them are distinctly vocalizing in specific nuclei, which, for example, the reticular nucleus has FOXG1 expression, um, while the uh, ZLI does not have it, but, in, in, but specifically has both the LHX1 positive expression. Um, and as you go more medially, um, essentially, you get domination just purely from the IN1 uh, midbrain derived inhibitory neurons. So this is in contrast to what we're seeing actually in the cortex where essentially these GABAergic or inhibitory neurons are actually shared across all, um, all areas. Well, we do see that with the midbrain derived one, but the forebrain uh, derived ones are more specific. Uh, so the uh, to kind of, kind of figure out where the origin of these FOXG1 positive neurons are, uh, we went into, um, uh, kind of how these uh, cell types are migrating from the forebrain. And they've been previously implicated um, in very old studies, but uh, we've done some validation stains in the stria terminalis, which is actually non-flamic. Uh, it essentially is right next to the uh, forebrain, uh, right under the ganglionic eminence, specifically the MGE. And it's already been shown that the MGE inhibitory neurons migrate into the stria terminalis. And in, in this specific section, what we see is this line of FOXG1 positive cells that hug the essential lining of the thalamus as it develops and essentially migrate inwards. And we kind of have validated the reticular uh, nuclei, ventral anterior, dorsal medial, and pulvinar nuclei with these FOXG1 derived um, uh, inhibitory neurons. We also think that um, some of the Fox G1 expression is also being uh, attenuated as they enter the thalamus. So it becomes trickier to actually uh, confidently identify them. Uh, and finally, uh, I, there's a lot of glial diversity, uh, but I'm not going to go too much into it. I just want to highlight a specific finding that we saw that um, this there is this kind of prolonged gliogenesis and potential neurogenesis. I don't want to specifically say that we were able to validate it in the medial axis of the uh, thalamus, which is kind of already known due to maturation gradients uh, that the lateral is more mature. But 
this uh, kind of posed an open question is that if there is prolonged neurogenesis, because most of neurogenesis of the thalamic neurons are ending or beginning begins and ends in the early first, or sorry, late first and early second trimester. And by GW23, there should be none, theoretically speaking, but this is quite exciting. And I think something we're trying to follow up on. Um, and kind of finally to conclude, uh, yeah, so hopefully we kind of have attempted to uh, figure out some of the neuronal organization principles in the thalamus, uh, in the thalamus and we kind of kind of made a schematic of some of these uh, inhibitory neurons, excitatory neuron types in specific nuclei. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Tom, my uh, advisor, as well as David Shin, my co-first author, who has been uh, instrumental in getting this uh, paper through. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cheng, for that great presentation. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers and to the NIH Brain Initiative for supporting this research. Uh, we'll now have time for Q&A. Um, please place any uh, questions into the Q&A box in Zoom. If you don't see that box, please click the three dots for more and select Q&A. Um, we have a couple of questions to start. Um, first, we have a question regarding the focus on cortex versus subcortical structures. Um, the question is if there's a sense for whether and how diversity in neurons in subcortical regions is different across humans, NHPs, and other mammals. Would anyone like to take that question? It's a big one. Uh, I could start. Um, I'm sure others have things to say. Um, well, so so we, our colleagues have um, built out a really comprehensive atlas of the mouse brain, and that's been recently released on our website and is a preprint currently. And there also we see really striking diversity in subcortical regions. Um, and um, we've done some very preliminary analyses aligning cell types between the, the human brain atlas and, and the mouse atlas. And um, yeah, I, I'm sure Kim can say more about the subcortical diversity, but we, we see really between those species, the diversity really does seem to be in subcortical regions. Beyond rodents and primates, I think that'll be really interesting to look. And I, I think, very important to to see in other model organisms. Um, you know, is this does this hold true across mammals, for example? Anyone else like to add to that question, or you have a couple others? Yeah, I, do, I don't have too much to add. I know Trinwa mentions. I, I, I've also done some preliminary analysis looking at it. And this does look like the mouse brain has also incredible amounts of diversity outside the cortex, like you said. And uh, it's. Uh, I think there's a lot to do in terms of really lining up those cell types across species, but at least in terms of their numbers, um, they look quite similar. And uh, preliminary analysis also looks like the cell types might correspond well. So yeah, I think it's... Uh, also very diverse outside the cortex and other species. Thanks so much. We have a question actually for Kimberly Saletti. Um, this uh, is, did you enrich for neurons before sequencing? Um, and there's a couple of specific questions about which e exact enrichment. Um, and if you, do you see death time related expression patterns in microglia or astrocytes, or did you correct for those expressions? Okay, yeah, so I didn't mention that we did enrich for neurons um, using fact sorting and new N antibody staining. Um, we aimed to get, we aimed so that each sample would be 90% neurons and 10% non neuronal cells. Um, that was pretty, we were pretty good at achieving that in the cortex. It was much harder to do outside of the cortex where it was a little bit harder to sort for neurons. So we didn't evenly get that kind of coverage across the entire brain, but we did our best to achieve it everywhere. So enriching for neurons. Uh, in terms of the second question, um, whether or not we see sort of cell death related phenomena, uh, I think that's really hard to say, uh, given that we only profiled three donors. Uh, I think we speculated that some of the transcriptomic signatures we saw in astrocytes were probably related to ischemia or something like this, but um, I, I think without being able to more comprehensively um, profile donors, um, it's hard to say if that was directly related to how long we sampled after um, death or the cause of death or anything like this. So it's hard to say that for sure. It's 
sorry, I'm muted. I'm wondering for each of the panelists, if you can tell us a little bit more about what's next um, for your project or this work. Um, you can go in any particular order. I won't call on anyone. Um, I, I guess I can start. Um, I think what's, I kind of briefly alluded it to it at the end. I think there's a lot more sampling to be done. I know the Allen Institute uh, is already working on this. Uh, there's, uh, you know, like I said, many regions where we didn't nearly, I think, sample enough to say how high the diversity is there. Uh, and I think more generally, I think the of course, the community has a lot of work to do in trying to relate these cell types to specific circuitry and function. And I think to start um, doing cross-species uh, comparisons will be really useful, as Trinko alluded to. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I think uh, Ed already mentioned that so there's uh, the, the uh, more bicam uh, phase of the next stage, and also for for us is basically uh, we will also do more samplings for more uh, uh, donors actually uh, you know that we only for now we only have a, a sample so from three donors and uh, you know the, the the diversity in the brain is a, is a huge there's no uh, two same brain so we want to see we actually want to see how the uh, the, the individual difference like the sex difference or the age difference or uh, um uh, other uh, 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 difference in, in in the brain, and also uh, I think another thing to to see because of the um, the um, not only the the molecular part, but also where this uh, cell comes from, you know, where is uh, neighbors is also important. So the next phase we also work on the like the the spatial omics, um, spatial transcriptomics to to not only see the molecular feature but also see the uh, spatial information from the cell, and I think that's will help us better understanding the the brain brain functions. Uh, hi. So since our work actually is just getting started, we would like to further collect more brain region. I mean, this neural structure, and also one important thing, we would like to combine more functional and also the single cell transcriptomic informations all this together to identify, identify the single cells, I mean, to classify the cell types in the brain regions. I think I need, it will help us to, to understand the brain in the single cell level probably more clearly. That's our goal. So that's the next step our, about our research. So as others have said, the NIH is supporting another large round of really comprehensive atlases through the Brain Initiative. Um, so getting really a picture of human brain, but also non-human primate, macaque, and marmoset, um, comprehensive cellular sampling, spatial um, information. And I think uh, as we learn the epigenomic features of cell types, that gives us a genetic hook to build tools to target those cells uh, to, to understand their function. Um, and, and long-term to treat disease. And there's the other interest I think is the question that came up is, you know, what does it look like beyond just rodents and primates? So we're looking at a select couple of regions, um, primary visual cortex and rhinal cortex um, across 14 different mammalian species to understand uh, how are, what's conserved uh, really deep in evolutionary time and, and what's changing. I think uh, everybody kind of summarized it, but I, I think for uh, being a developmental biologist, I think some of uh, some aspects I think our lab has been interested in, I think would be uh, important is kind of like actual lineage tracing uh, readouts to actually ver verify some of the hierarchies that we're actually defining. Um, I think there has been some, uh, so there are some earlier studies showing that there is a divergence between human and mice with a lot of these lineages. And I think kind of, actually validating some of that along on top of the functional characterization uh, of these uh, cell diversities that we're seeing. So, yeah. Great, thank you all for that uh, insight into what's happening next in this in this space. Um, we have another question about, um, about some translational work. So based on the work done so far, is there some sense of how conservation or lack of conservation of cell types can inform translational research? So when might it be useful, for example, to study circuits in mice versus in NHPs?
Uh, sure. Um, yeah, no, I think I think that this kind of comparative work at a transcriptomic level hopefully will um, guide guide selection of model organisms. So if they're, for example, if one wants to know the action of a, of a drug, for example, in a model organism, but the receptors, the known receptors for that drug have are expressed in different cell types. Uh, you might want to select the organism where it's it's targeting the type that you expect it to, for example. Um, or if you know, we know we already know that there are some cell types that have kind of redistributed uh, into different brain regions, for example, in the thalamus. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think maybe this could this could help guide um, based on sort of a cellular level knowledge of the circuit. Great, thank you. Um, another question for any or all of the speakers. What was the biggest benefit of working in a consortium like the NIH Brain Initiatives Brain Initiative Cell Sen Census Network, um, BICCN consortium, for you doing this work? Um, maybe I can say it. I think uh, working in the consortium was really useful because uh, you know there were studies going on in you know, multiple species, multiple modalities and across developments. And these findings actually support one another a lot of the time. So it was very helpful to be able to uh, perform your own analysis and then compare with everything else going on because it gave us some confidence that some of the cell types we were seeing were were real and that there were you know that their origins made sense and so I think that for me that was one of the most exciting aspects of working in the consortium I mean of course also just having access to more data um, also improves your analysis but it was uh yeah great also to have confirmation from everyone about what uh, your findings Great. Well, that's all the questions we have submitted. So thank you again to all the speakers for joining us. Um, thank you to the NIH Brain Initiative for supporting the BICCN program. And thank you to all of you attendees um, who were a great audience today and submitted some excellent questions. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.